third Sunday after the Epiphany. The Gospel of the Sunday according to Matthew. At that, at that time, when Jesus had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and adored him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus, stretching forth his hand, touched him, saying, I will be thou made clean. And forthwith his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus saith to him, See thou tell no man, but go, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. And when he had entered into Capernaum, there came to him a centurion, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, and is grievously tormented. And Jesus saith to him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion making answer said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst under my roof, but only say the word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man subject to authority, having under me soldiers. And I say to this, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. And Jesus, hearing this, marveled and said to them that followed him, Amen, I say to you, I have not found so great faith in Israel. And I say to you that many shall come from the west and the east, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into the exterior darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, Go, and as thou hast believed, so be it done to thee. And the servant was healed at the same hour. Parallel Gospels according to Mark. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down, said to him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus, having compassion on him, stretched forth his hand, and touching him, saith to him, I will, be thou made clean. And when he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was made clean. And he strictly charged him, and forthwith sent him away. And he saith to him, See thou tell no one, but go, shew thyself to the high priest, and offer for thy cleansing the things that Moses commanded, for a testimony to them. But he, being gone out, began to publish and to blaze abroad the word, so that he could not openly go into the city, but was without in desert places. And they flocked to him from all sides. The Gospel according to Luke. And it came to pass, when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who, seeing Jesus, and falling on his face, besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And stretching forth his hand, he touched him, saying, I will, be thou cleansed. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. And he charged him that he should tell no man, but go, shew thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing according as Moses commanded for a testimony to them. But the fame of him went abroad and more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And the servant of a certain centurion, who was dear to him, being sick, was ready to die. And when he had heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the ancients of the Jews, desiring him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him earnestly, saying to him, He is worthy that thou shouldst do this for him, for he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. And Jesus went with them. And when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent his friends to him, saying, Lord, Trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof. For which cause neither did I think myself worthy to come to thee. But say the word, and my servant shall be healed. 
For I also am a man subject to authority, having under me soldiers. And I say to one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. Which Jesus, hearing, marveled, and turning about to the multitudes that followed him, he said, Amen, I say to you, I have not found so great faith, not even in Israel. And they who were sent, being returned to the house, found the servant whole who had been sick. Exposition from the Catina Aurea When Jesus had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. After his sermon and instruction, an occasion presented itself for working a miracle, so that by means of a miracle the sermon just heard might be confirmed. Because he taught as one having power, and so that his manner of teaching might not be regarded as presumptuous, he creates the same impression by his works, as one having power to heal. Accordingly, the gospel says, when he had come down. While the Lord was preaching on the mountain, his disciples were with him, to whom it was given to know the secrets of heavenly doctrine. But now, coming down from the mountain, the multitudes who had been unable to ascend the mountain followed him, as they on whom the burden of sin lies are not able to ascend to the heights of the sacred mysteries. But when the Lord came down, that is, stooping to the infirmity and weakness of these others, he had compassion on their imperfections. The multitudes followed him, some out of love for him, others because of his teaching, and many because of his healing and comfort. By the mountain on which the Lord was sitting, heaven is signified, of which it is written, Heaven is my throne. But while the Lord was sitting on the mountain, only his disciples came to him, because before he took upon himself our human frailty, God was known only in Judea. And however, after he came down from the mountain of his divinity and assumed the weakness of human nature, a great multitude of the nations followed him. It, it is thus shown to those who must teach that their discourse should be tempered to their hearers and that they should announce the word of God according to what they see is the capacity of each one. The teachers go up into the mountain when they make known the higher truths to the more advanced. They come down when they teach the simpler truths to the weaker ones. And behold, a leper came and adored him. Among those who had not ascended the mountain, there was a leper who had been unable to ascend, carrying, as it were, the burthen of his sins. For the sins of our soul are a leprosy. The Lord therefore comes down from heaven as from a high mountain to cleanse the leprosy of our sins. And so as it were prepared beforehand, the leper meets him coming down. Hence we have, and behold, a leper came. He runs to meet him as he comes down. On the mountain he did not venture to speak, because there is a time for everything under heaven, a time for teaching and a time for healing. On the mountain he taught, he cured souls, he healed hearts. This being done, as he comes down from the heavenly mountain to redeem frail humanity, a leper comes and adores him. Before he makes his prayer, he begins by adoring, by paying homage. He did not seek him out as a skilled physician, but adores him as God. Faith and the confession of faith is a perfect prayer. Hence the leper, adoring, fulfills the duty of faith, the duty of confession he fulfills by words. Hence he adored him, saying, Lord, by thee were all things made. Therefore, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Thy will is necessary. Thy works obey thy will. Thou in a former time cleansed Naaman the Syrian of leprosy by thy servant Eliseus. And now, if thou wilt it, would thou canst make me clean. He did not say, If you will ask God for me, nor if you will adore for me, but he said, If you will it, you can make me clean. 
Neither did he say, Lord, clean me, but defers all to him and calls him Lord and attributes to him power over the universe. Thus he offers spiritual payment to his spiritual physician. For as physicians are paid in money, he is paid with prayer. In this that he says, If thou wilt, he doubts not that the will of Christ is disposed to every good work. But because corporal health is not profitable to everyone, he knew not whether this healing would be a gain to him. He says, therefore, if thou wilt, as if he said, I believe that what is good thou wilt. I know not, however, if what I ask is for me a good. And Jesus, stretching forth his hand, touched him. Since he can heal by will or by word, he puts forth his hand and touches him. Hence we read, And Jesus, stretching forth his hand, touched him, that he might show that he was not subject to the law, and that to the clean nothing is unclean. Eliseus, however, observing the law in its detail, did not go forth and put his hand on Naaman, but sent him to wash in the Jordan. The Lord makes plain that he heals and touches not as a servant of the law, but as Lord, for not by leprosy is his hand made unclean. Rather, at the touch of his hand, the leprous body is made whole. He came not alone to heal the body, but that he might guide the soul to true wisdom. So therefore, as he now forbids not to eat with unwashed hands, so here does he also teach us that only the leprosy of the soul is to be feared, which is sin, and that leprosy of the body is no impediment to virtue. he undid the letter of the law, he did not undo its purpose. The law forbade to touch a leper, because it could not secure that leprosy would not stain the one so touching. Therefore, it forbade the touching of a leper, not that the lepers might not be healed, but so that those touching a leper might not be stained. But he is not stained in touching the leper, rather in touching him he cleanses the leper. For he was not alone God, but also man. Hence by touch and by word he wrought divine wonders, so that divine actions might be accomplished by his voice and also by his body. When he touched the leper, no one reproached him, because his hearers were not yet possessed by envy. If he had cured him silently, who would have known by what power he was healed? The will to heal was awakened because of the leper. The words were for those who were present. Therefore he says, I will be thou made clean. The words must not, as many Latins think, be read, read linked together, but separately. First, I will is said. Then, as though commanding, be thou made clean. The leper had said, if you will. The Lord replied, I will. The leper said, Thou canst make me clean. The Lord answered, Be thou made clean. Nowhere else does he appear to say this word, though he worked many miracles. But here he added, I will, so that he might establish in both leper and people a belief in his power. Nature obeyed him with fitting promptness. Hence, and forthwith, his leprosy was cleansed. But the word forthwith does not convey the speed with which the miracle was accomplished. As he hesitated not to believe the healing was not delayed, because he delayed not in declaring his belief the cleansing was not delayed. Luke also mentions the healing of the leper, though not in this order, but recalling as they who write are wont to events they had forgotten, or telling beforehand what happened later as these things were divinely brought to their minds, things known before, but remembering them afterwards and putting them down in writing. And Jesus said to him, See thou tell no man, but go show thyself. Having cured his body, Jesus bids him tell no one, hence 
And Jesus saith to him, See thou tell no man. Some say that he so commanded him so that malice might not be stirred up because of the healing, which is foolishness. For he did not heal so that the healing should remain doubtful. Rather, he ordered him to tell no one, so that he might teach us not to be taken up with boasting and vain glory. Why then does he order a person healed on another occasion to proclaim the fact? In that case he was teaching men to be grateful. For there he did not command that he himself be proclaimed, but that glory be given to God. In the case of the leper he teaches us to turn from vain glory. In the other, that we ought never be ungrateful, but should refer all things in the praise and glory of God. And indeed, what need was there that he should spread abroad by word what was proclaimed by his body, since the healing was besought rather than offered silence is imposed. But go, show thyself to the priest. He sends him to the priests, first because of submission, that he might be seen to be subject to the priests, then so that they, seeing the leper made clean, might be saved, should they believe in the Savior. If, however, they would not believe, they would be inexcusable. And also, so that he may not appear to infringe the law, an accusation they were frequently to make. For he neither everywhere dissolved it, nor everywhere observed it, but sometimes did the one and sometimes the other. In the one case, preparing the way of the future wisdom, in the other, stopping the shameless mouths of the Jews and deferring to their weakness. For this reason, the apostles seem sometimes to observe the law and sometimes to ignore it. Or he sent them to the priest that they might learn that not by the requirements of law had he had been made clean, but by the action of grace. There was a precept of the law that whoever was made clean of leprosy should offer gifts to the priests, hence, and offer the gift which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Do not understand this as saying that Moses commanded this for a testimony to them, but go you and offer it for a testimony unto them. Christ, foreseeing no fruit from this, said, not for their correction, but for a testimony or accusation against them. For what is to be done by me has been done. Although he foreknew that they would not amend the error of their ways, he did not on that account neglect what was due on this occasion. They, however, remained in their evil dispositions. He did not say, The gift which I order, but which Moses commanded, so as to remit him to the law and stop the mouths of the malicious, that they may not have it to say that he usurped the prestige of the priests. He himself performed the wonder, but to them he yielded its approbation. Or offer thy gift, so that all who see you bring it may believe the miracle. Or he orders that the gift be offered, so that afterwards, should the priest seek to drive the man forth, he then could say to them, you accepted the gift from me, as from one made whole. How now do you drive me forth as a leper? Or we must read what Moses commanded for a testimony, as meaning that what Moses laid down was in witness, not an effect of the law. Should anyone bring it forward that since the Lord seems to approve the sacrifice of Moses, why does the church also not accept it? Let him keep in mind that Christ had not yet offered in his passion his own body as a victim. The foreshadowing sacrifices ought not to be put away till that which they prefigured would be confirmed by the testimony of the apostles' preaching and by the faith of believing peoples. This man typifies the whole human race, for he was not alone a leper. He is described in the Gospel of Luke as being full of leprosy. For all have sinned, and do need the glory of God, that glory whereby, in putting forth the hand of the Savior, that is, of the incarnate Word of God, and touching human nature, all men are made clean of the wound of the primeval error, 
so that they who were for so long considered as unclean and cast forth from the camp of the people of God, now being at length restored to priest and temple, can offer up their own bodies as a living sacrifice to him, of whom it was said, Thou art a priest forever. Mystically, by the leper, the sinner is signified, as sin makes the soul unclean and inconstant, who falls down before Christ when troubled by its former sins, which it must yet confess, and for them implore pardon. For the leper shows his scars and seeks a remedy. The Lord puts forth his hand when he bestows the help of the divine mercy. Immediately there follows the forgiveness of our sins. Neither is the sinner restored to the church except by the decree of the priest. And when he had entered into Capharnaum, there came to him a centurion, after the Lord had taught the disciples upon the mountain and healed the leper at the foot of the mountain, he came to Capharnaum as fulfilling a mystery. For after the cleansing of the Jews, he came to the Gentiles. For Capharnaum, which is interpreted as meaning seat of abundance or a field of consolation, signifies the church, which is gathered together from the Gentiles and is filled with spiritual fatness, according to the words, let my soul be filled as with marrow and fatness. And amid the distresses of the world, she is comforted from on high, as the psalmist says, Thy comforts have given joy to my soul. Hence is said, when he had entered into Capharnaum, there came to him a centurion. And this centurion was from the Gentiles, for now the Jewish people had among them an army of imperial Rome. This centurion was the first fruits of the Gentiles, in comparison with whose faith the faith of all Jews is seen to be unfaith. He who neither heard Christ preaching, nor had seen the leper cleansed, having only heard about the leper, believed more than he heard. For he was a type of the future's people, who had read neither the law nor the prophets concerning Christ, nor had seen Christ himself performing miracles. He came therefore asking and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy and is grievously tormented. And saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy. See here the good heart of this centurion, who hastened so anxiously to secure the healing of his servant as if he were about to suffer not a money loss by the death of his servant, but rather his own health. For he regarded not the difference between master and servant, for though in this world their dignity varies, yet are they one in nature. See to the faith of the centurion, in that he said not, Come and heal him, because the Lord, being in every place, was present there already. See his wisdom, since he said not, Even here heal him. For he knew that he had power to do so, wisdom to understand, mercy to hear. Accordingly he makes known the sickness. The restoring of health he leaves to the power of his mercy, saying, And is grievously tormented, from which it is clear that he loved him. For each one thinks that the loved one suffers more than he does, even though he be but moderately ill. He mentions all these things with grief, that he is lying ill, the palsy, the fact that he's tormented, that he may show the anxiety of his soul and move the Lord. So ought all to suffer with their servants and seek their cure. Some, however, say that, excusing himself, he said this is as the reason for not bringing him there, for it was not possible, paralyzed as he was, to bring him. Luke said he was at the point of death. But I say that this was a sign of great faith, even greater than theirs who let a sick man down through the roof. For he knew with certainty that a simple word sufficed to heal him, and so it was superfluous to bring him. As the infirm of this world and as weakened by the contagion of sin, so must the Gentiles be spiritually regarded. 
All their members are relaxed and unable to fulfill the tasks of standing and walking. The mystery of whose healing is prefigured in this servant of the centurion, who is himself said to have been the first of the Gentiles to believe. Who this leader is, the canticle of Moses narrates, where it says, He appointed the bonds of people according to the number of children of Israel. Or by the centurion are signified those who were the first among the Gentiles to believe, and who were perfected in virtue. For he is called a centurion, who has placed over a hundred men, and the hundred is the perfect number. Rightly, therefore, does the centurion plead for his servant, because the first fruits of the Gentiles plead before God for the salvation of all the Gentiles. And Jesus saith to him, I will come and heal him. The Lord, seeing the faith of the centurion, his humility and his concern, immediately promised that he will come and heal the servant. Hence follows, And Jesus saith to him, I will come and heal him. What he never did, Jesus does here. For everywhere he follows the will of his suppliants. Here he goes beyond it, and not alone promises to heal, but also to go to the house. He does this that we may learn the virtue of the centurion. For unless he had said, I will come and heal him, never would this man have replied, I am not worthy. Then, since he was pleading for his servant, the Lord promised to go, that he might teach us not to flatter the great and despise the lowly, but to honor alike both rich and poor. And the centurion, making answer, said, Lord, I am not worthy. As we praise the faith of the centurion, in that he believes that the paralytic could be healed by the Savior, so also he reveals his own humility in this, that he considered himself unworthy that the Lord should enter his house. Hence, and the centurion, making answer, said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof. Because of his awareness of what the life of the Gentile was, he considered himself shamed rather than helped by this honor. Although he was endowed with faith, he was yet not strengthened by the sacraments. In saying he was not worthy, he showed himself worthy that Christ, the word of the Lord, should enter, not into his house, but into his heart. Neither would he have said this with such face and humility, unless he bore him in his heart, of whom he was here apprehensive lest he enter his house, for it would be no great joy should Jesus enter his house and not enter his heart. Mystically, this roof is the body which covers the soul and closes in the mind from the vision of heaven. But God does not disdain to dwell within flesh, nor to enter under the roof of our body. For even now, when the rulers of the church, holy and pleasing to God, enter under our roof, then through them the Lord enters, and let you regard it as though the Lord were entering. And when you eat and drink the body and blood of the Lord, then the Lord enters under your roof, and then, humbling yourself, repeat, Lord, I am not worthy. When he enters a place that is not worthy, there he enters in judgment on the one so receiving him. The wisdom of the centurion is here apparent. Seeing beyond the outward cloak of the body, he discerns the veiled divinity, Whence he adds, But only say the word, and my servant shall be healed. For he knew that ministering angels were invisibly standing by, who would turn each word of his into work, and should the angels be still, the sickness would still be cast forth by his healing words. For I also am a man subject to authority, having under me soldiers. The centurion says that his servant could be healed by a word, because all salvation for the Gentiles is by faith, and the true life of all men is in the commandments of the Lord. And so he adds, For I also am a man subject to authority, having under me soldiers, 
And I say to this, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. Under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he depicts here the mystery of the Father and the Son, as though he said, Although I am under the power of another, yet I have power to order those under me, so that you also, although subject to the power of the Father, that is, as man, you have yet the power to command the angels. But perhaps Sibelius will see, seeking to show that the Father and the Son are the same, the same person. So must this be understood. If I, placed subject to authority, can yet command, how much more you, who are under the power of no one, but the text does not support this interpretation, for he did not say, If I am subject to authority, but said, For I also am a man subject to authority, in which between himself and Christ he makes not a distinction of contrast, but puts forward a basis of resemblance. As above, if I, who am subject to authority, have the power to order, what canst thou do to whom all power is subject. Thou canst, by the ministry of angels, and without the presence of the body, say to the infirmity that it shall depart, and it departs, and to health that it come, and it comes. By the subjects of the centurion we may understand the natural virtues, in which many of the Gentiles were strong, or even good and evil thoughts, let us say to the evil ones that they go, and they will go. And let us call to us good thoughts, and they will come. Let us say also to our servant, that is, to our body, that it be subject to the divine will. To what is here said, there seems to be opposed that which Luke says. When he had heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the ancients of the Jews, desiring him to come and heal his servant. And again, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent his friends to him, saying, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof. Some say that this is not the same reason as that other, though they have points of resemblance. So of the one Luke records, He loveth our nation, and hath built us a synagogue, and of the other, the Lord himself said, Amen, I say to you, I have not found so great faith even in Israel. And accordingly, it would seem he was not a Jew. To me, however, it seems one and the same person. But when Luke says that he sent that he might come, he is hinting at the flatteries of the Jews. It is possible that the centurion wished to come but was prevented by the flatteries of the Jews and by their saying, We shall go and bring him. But when he is free of their importunity, he says, Do not think that it was through sloth that I have not come, but because I did not think that I was worthy to receive you under my roof. And if Matthew says that he says this, not through his friends, but himself in person, this is not contradictory. For both bear witness to the eager desire of the man and to the belief he had regarding Christ. But it seems probable that after sending his friends, he himself also said this to him as he approached. And if Luke does not say this, nor Matthew the other, they do not contradict each other. Rather, they fill up that which either may have omitted. Matthew wished, therefore, in this compendious way, to speak of an approach which the centurion had made through others, because the Lord had praised the faith whereby the centurion had approached to God, that he might say, I have not found such great faith in Israel. Luke, however, has unfolded the whole incident as it happened, so that from this we are compelled to understand how Matthew, who would not lie, has said in what manner he viewed it. Neither is it a contradiction that he built a synagogue, as Luke records, and that he is known not to be a Jew. 
For it is possible for one, while not being a Jew, to build a synagogue and to love that nation. And Jesus, hearing this, marveled, as that which the leper had said regarding the power of Christ, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean, was confirmed by the words of Christ, I will be thou made clean. So here also Christ, not alone, does not reproach the centurion for bearing testimony to his power. He commends him. He does more. For the evangelist, giving an indication of his praise, says, And Jesus, hearing this, marveled. Observe how great a thing, and what kind of thing, it is at which Jesus, the only begotten of God, marvels. Gold, riches, kingdoms, principalities, in his eyes are but a shadow, or a flower that fades. In the eyes of God no single one of these is wonderful, or great, or precious, save only faith. At this he marvels, honoring it. This he regards as acceptable to him. Who had wrought in him that faith but he who marveled at it? But if another wrought it, why should he marvel who foreknew it? That the Lord marvels means that we must marvel who have need to be so moved. In him all such motions are signs, not of a spirit moved, but of one who gives an example. And so in the presence of all the people he is said to marvel at him and set him before others as an example that they might imitate him. For there follows, Amen, I say to you, I have not found so great faith in Israel. He praises his faith, but he did not bid him give up the military life. He said this of those living in Israel, not of former prophets and patriarchs. For Andrew believed, but only upon hearing John say, Behold the Lamb of God. Peter believed, but upon hearing the good news from Andrew. Philip believed, but through reading the scriptures. And before that, Nathanael received proof of his divinity and so made a confession of faith. Jairus, the prince of Israel, when he was beseeching him on behalf of his daughter, did not say, Say but the word, but come quickly. Nicodemus, hearing of the mystery of faith, said, How can this be done? Mary and Martha said to the Lord that if he had been there, their brother would not have died, as it were doubting that the power of God could be everywhere. Or if we wish to regard him as more believing than the apostles, we must then understand the testimony of Christ to mean that the good which anyone does is to be praised according to the capacity of that person. For an unlettered person to say something profound is a great thing, which from a philosopher is a matter that excites no wonder. In this sense was it said of the centurion that in no one in Israel have I found such faith. For it was not the same thing for a Jew to believe as for one outside the nation. Or perhaps in the centurion the faith of the Gentiles is praised above that of Israel. Hence he says, And I say to you that many shall come from the east and the west. He does not say all, but many, and these from the east and the west. By these two parts the whole world is indicated. Or they come from the east, who as soon as they are baptized pass away. From the west, they who have suffered persecution for the faith unto death. Or from the east he comes who began from his childhood to serve God. From the west, he who was converted in old age to the service of God. But how does he elsewhere say that but few are chosen? Because throughout many generations, few are chosen in each one, brought together in the time of visitation they are found to be many and shall lie down, not in the bodily sense, but spiritually at rest, not in temporal rejoicing, but feasting eternally with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, where are light and joy and glory and length of eternal days. Since the God of Abraham, creator of heaven, is the Father of Christ, 
So all nations that have believed in Christ, the Son of the Creator, will take their rest with Abraham in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into the exterior. As we see, Christians invited to the heavenly banquet where the bread of heavenly justice is dispensed and the drink of wisdom, so do we see the Jews rejected. Hence follows, the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into exterior darkness, that is, the Jews who receive the law, who commemorate the figures of the things to come, yet reject them now fulfilled. Or he calls the Jews the children, children of the kingdom, because amongst them God aforetime reigned. Or he means as the children of the kingdom, those for whom the kingdom was prepared, because against these was he more in wrath. If then Moses commended to the people of Israel no other God, but the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, the same does Christ command. He does not attempt to turn his people from their God, but he therefore warns them that they will go into exterior darkness because he sees them turn from their God, in whose kingdom the Gentiles, called from the whole world, will recline, he says, with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob, and for no other cause than that they held fast to the faith of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. The darkness is called exterior, since he who is driven forth from the Lord leaves the light behind. What they will suffer there, he reveals when he adds, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. By a metaphor, he describes the punishments of the tormented, for at the contact of smoke eyes are wont to shed tears, and teeth rattle in intense cold. He indicates, therefore, that the reprobate will suffer intolerably heat and cold in hell, as Job also says, let him pass from the snow waters to excessive heat. If there shall be weeping of eyes and of grinding of teeth means bones, then it is true that there will be a resurrection of bodies and of those members that have fallen away. Or gnashing of teeth indicates the disposition of an angry man, because he has repented too late and is angry with himself in that he continued to offend with persistent iniquity. Or differently, he calls the outer nations exterior darkness. For as regards history, Christ has in these words foretold the tragedy of the Jewish people, and that because of their infidelity they would be led captive and scattered throughout the nations of the earth. Weeping is wont to be caused by heat, chattering of teeth by cold, the weeping, therefore, is ascribed to those who dwell in the hotter regions, as in India and Ethiopia, the chattering of teeth in those who live in the colder countries, as Hyrcania and Scythia. And Jesus said to the centurion, Go, and as thou hast believed, so be it. Lest anyone think that these were but words of flattery, that he was praised for believing, he creates confidence by a sign. Hence follows, And Jesus said to the centurion, Go, and as thou hast believed, so be it done to thee. As if to say, Let this favor be done to thee in accordance with the measure of your faith. The merit of the master can also avail the servants, not alone the merit of his faith, but his zeal for the law of God. We may marvel how speedily it was done. The power of Christ is shown in this, that not alone does he heal, but he heals swiftly in a moment of time. For as the Lord did not enter bodily into the house of the centurion, but absent in body, yet present in power, he heals the servant. So was he present in body in the midst of the Jewish people. Among no other peoples was he either born of a virgin or had he suffered, or borne human afflictions, or wrought divine wonders. And yet he fulfilled what was said of him, A people which I knew not hath served me, at the hearing of the ear they have obeyed me. The Jewish people knew him, and crucified him. The whole earth has heard of him, and believed.
or again priest and confessor on the healing of the leper. And when he was come down from the mountain, when Jesus was teaching on the mountain top, his disciples were with him, to whom it was given to know the secrets of his heavenly doctrine, through which the heart of the insentient world would be seasoned by the knowledge of salvation, and by means of which the eyes of the blind, obscured by the shadows of earthly indulgence, would open to the light of truth. Hence the Lord says to us, You are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. And now, coming down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. They could in no way ascend the mountain, because they upon whom the burthen of sin lies heavily, unless they cast off their load, are wholly unable to ascend to the heights of the divine mysteries. So neither, long ago, could the children of Israel go up the mountain and behold the face of the Lord for they were hampered by the burthen of the manner of life which they had learned in Egypt. So Moses alone ascended, and with him a few among the elders of Israel. Accordingly, as the apostles ascended the mountain with the Lord, so now do faithful souls that fear God, that love God, desiring his heavenly kingdom, and forever following after the Lord, go up after him unto the heavenly mountain, hearing the apostle saying, Mind the things that are above, not the things that are upon the earth. The Lord coming down, that is, stooping down to the infirmity and helplessness of the others, and merciful towards their weakness and misery, the multitudes followed him, some because they loved him, many because of his doctrine, and not a few because of his healing and compassion. And behold a leper, one of those who sought to be cured, who longed for deliverance, came and adored him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Running to him as he comes down, you beg him, O man, but on the mountain you spoke not. Why is this? Because all things have their season, a time for teaching and a time for healing. On the mountain he taught, he enlightened, he cured souls, he healed hearts. Because of these greater things I was reluctant to speak. I stood aside for these supreme things. Having completed these tasks, he comes down from the heavenly mountain to heal all flesh, and there comes to him a man, a leper, adoring him. Before he makes his petition, he begins by adoring him. Before he begs, he renders homage. He adored him. By this action, addressing him as Lord and God, he adored him. As those blessed magi first kneeling down adored him, and then offered their gifts, so in like manner this man, falling down, adored him, and in this way presented his petition, saying, Lord, thou who art fittingly adored and rightfully served, I adore thee as Lord. And so as Lord I call upon thee, confessing thy works. By thee are all things made. Thou, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Thou hast willed that this unclean leprosy should come upon me, either because of my sins, that being chastised I may do penance, or because of thy providence, that miraculously healing me thou mayest be glorified. All things are done by thy command and disposition, and thou givest health abundantly. Therefore, whether I am afflicted with this leprosy because of my sins, wiping out my sins, heal me, or whether because of thy providence, miraculously heal me, that thou mayest be glorified before men. Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. There is need here of thy will, because creatures obey only thy will, and so if thou will, thou canst make me clean. I do not falter doubting, nor do I speak as he who besought the healing of his son. If thou canst do anything, help us. But I know that thou canst do all things, and here I petition not thy power, nor seek thy might. Men I know are weak, but I implore thy will and the power that follows it will immediately perform this grace for me. Lord, if thou wilt, 
thou canst make me clean. To me the gain, to thee the praise, to all who behold thy wonder and increase in knowledge of the truth. Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Thou who by thy servant Eliseus didst cleanse of leprosy, Naaman, the prince of Syria, bidding him wash in the Jordan, now if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. To whom in reply the Lord says, Believing, you confess that I can, and that if I will it comes to pass, accordingly I will be thou made clean. Wondrously hast thou believed, and wondrously art thou healed. Without measure thou hast confessed, without measure art thou made joyful. I will be thou made clean. You faltered not in believing, I am quick to heal. You delayed not to confess your faith, I delay not to cleanse thee. I will be thou made clean. That I may show thee great favor, I stretch forth my hand to thee, and stretching forth his hand, touched him, saying, I will be thou made clean. And why did he touch him, since the law forbade the touching of a leper? For this did he touch, that he might show that all things are clean to the clean. Because the filth that is in one person adheres not to others, neither does external uncleanness defile the clean of heart. But wherefore in this circumstance does he touch him, that he might instruct us in humility, that he might teach us that we should despise no one, or abhor them, or regard them as pitiable, because of some wound of their body, some blemish that is sent by God, for which it is he that will give reason and render an account. I am the heavenly physician, he says. I can cure bodies as well as souls, and so I touch all, not that their infirmities may adhere to me, but that I may drive them from those who are afflicted. For I am the incomparable sun and the moon of justice, and so I draw nigh to all, and I shine in all my splendor unto their salvation. I am as I was, and I abide in the beauty of my own singular holiness. Stretching forth his hand, he touched him. I do not despise the law, but I cure the wound. I do not dissolve the precept, but I banish and cleanse this leprosy. And so when I stretch forth my hand, it goes away nor can its taint come near my perfection, nor resist my power. I say, therefore, I will be thou made clean. And stretching forth his hand to touch, the leprosy immediately departs, and the hand of the Lord is found to have touched not a leper, but a body made clean. Let us, let us consider here, beloved brethren, if there be any one that has a taint of leprosy in his soul, or the contamination of guilt in his heart, if he has, instantly adoring God, let him say to him, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Thou hast long ago cleansed Naaman, who committed many crimes, and thou hast had compassion throughout the ages on an immeasurable number of others who have besought thee. Thou therefore, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And the Lord, swiftly stretching forth the hand of his mercy, will say, I will, be thou made clean, as Jesus says it to the one he cleansed of leprosy. The Lord had compassion on this man who believed in him, who trusted in his power. To him Jesus said, Thou hast believed, you are healed, thou hast hoped, you are made clean. Forget not what you were, nor what you are now made into. Cease not to give thanks, nor cease to confess the Lord. Beloved, this also we must do, as often as he has delivered us from some peril, or comforted us in some grief, or infirmity, or sickness, or from any extremity whatsoever. Let us not be ungrateful, nor forgetful of our benefactor, but speedily render him thanks, and let us offer a gift according to our means to show him honor, 
for this also the Lord commands. But go, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift which Moses commanded, for a testimony unto them. Jesus therefore saith to him, See thou tell no man. And wherefore, Lord, will he tell no one? Because of my humility, because of my hidden sweetness, and you let this be a lesson unto you, Whenever you do anything of good, do not seek to be honored for it before men, to be extolled, to be foolishly pleased, as is the way with so many when they do a little good, or have fasted, or given an alms to the poor, or a gift in honor of an altar, or in honor of the saints. For these seek to be glorified before men, and to please themselves, losing their reward with God. See you tell no man, but thou be silent, this deed will most wondrously cry out. Though thou open not thy mouth, every member of thy body will be exalted. Yesterday unclean, today clean, but a little while ago repulsive, now most pleasing. See thou tell no man, but go, show thyself to the priest. For as you go walking to the temple, all who see thee will be astonished, and the priest beholding thee will feel a sense of dread, since according to the law, once and yet a second time, you were shut up by him, and then showing thyself it was found that you could not be made clean. Go therefore, show thyself to the priest, that seeing you he may know that you were made clean, not through the observances of the law, but by the operation of grace, not by the shadow that is earthly priest, but by the heavenly splendor of the high priest. Go, shew thyself to the priest. Sent by the high priest, show thyself to the priest, cleansed as thou art by the high priest of God the Father. But be not seen in the presence of God, nor come not before the high priest with empty hands. Come not into the midst of the holy temple without fruit, but offer a gift. This that was spoken to him is said to us all, and admonishes us that we hold not our gifts and our possessions to ourselves, but use them to give thanks, especially when delivered from some tribulation. Offer, he says, thy gift, and wherefore, that all who see thee bearing it and offering it may believe in this wonder, and may give thanks to God, who has had compassion on you, and to the unbelieving let it be a reproach and a testimony of the hardness of their hearts. So likewise the man lying for eight and twenty years in infirmity, raising him up from his sickness, he bids him take up his bed and go into his house, so that the bed, being borne by him through the city, would proclaim the wonder, making known and praising him that he had healed him. So did he send the blind man to the pool of Silo, so that others, seeing the blind man walking there and returning cured, being struck with wonder, would believe in him that wrought such signs and wonders who liveth and reigneth, world without end. Amen. St. Jerome, Priest and Doctor, The Healing of the Leper When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him, and behold, a leper came and adored him. As the Lord came down from the mountain, the multitudes met him because they were unable to ascend to the heights. And the first to meet him was a leper. Because of his leprosy, he had been unable to hear the wondrous discourse of the Savior spoken on the mountain, and observed that he was the first to be miraculously cured, then, secondly, the servant of the centurion, thirdly, 
the mother-in-law of St. Peter, of a fever in Capernaum. In the fourth place, those that were brought to him possessed with devils, whose evil spirits he cast forth with his word, when all that were sick he healed. Fittingly, after his sermon and instruction, an occasion presents itself for a sign, so that the sermon they had heard might be confirmed by the power of a miracle. Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. He who petitions the will of the Lord does not doubt his power. And Jesus, stretching forth his hand, stretching forth his hand, immediately the leprosy disappears. Consider here again how humble and unassuming the answer. The leper had said, If thou wilt. The Lord answers, I will. The leper had already said, Thou canst make me clean. The Lord joins both requests and says, Be thou made clean. Not therefore, as many Latins are of opinion, must we unite and read together these phrases, as, I will be thou made clean, but separately, as that he first says, I will, then, as it were commanding, he says, Be thou made clean. And Jesus saith, See thou tell no man. And indeed, what need was there that he should boast by word of that which his body proclaimed? But go, shew thyself to the priest, he bids him, for various reasons, go to the priest. First, out of humility, so that he will be seen to give honor to the priests, for there was a precept of the law that whosoever was cleansed of leprosy should make an offering to the priests. Again, that those seeing the leper now made clean would either believe in the Savior or would not believe. If they believed, they would be saved. If they believe not, they would be inexcusable. And lastly, lest he might not seem to infringe the law, of which they were frequently to accuse him. St. John Chrysostom on the Gospel And when he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Note that only the disciples are said to have gone up the mountain to Jesus, but coming down from the mountain, the multitude followed him, and indeed great multitudes, because the mountain is the summit of virtue, the very pinnacle of the church, on which the multitudes cannot come nigh to Christ, either because they are burdened with sin or laden with worldly cares. They cannot draw near to Christ, nor hear the sublime discourse he spoke upon the mountain. Only his disciples can who are free of the fevers of the vices and unburthened by the cares of this world. Accordingly, as free and unencumbered, they come unto Christ that they may hear his more sublime discourses, becoming his imitators in all things. Yet, when from the heights of his compassion he came down to the lowly, who because of human infirmities were unable to hear him on the mountaintop, then greater multitudes followed him. And behold the leper. You must know that both Luke and Mark tell first of the cure of the man possessed by an unclean spirit, and secondly of the woman who was freed of the bodily infirmity of fevers, because God has greater concern for the salvation of the soul than the body. First, because the soul is of higher dignity than the body. For the soul can live without the body, but the body without the soul cannot survive. Second, in every sin it is the soul that first sins, then the body sins. Unless the soul be first overcome, the flesh could never sin. The flesh can first be moved with desire for that which is evil, but cannot sin unless the soul shall first consent. For the flesh is subject to the power of the soul, not the soul to the flesh. So it was necessary that the soul which first had fallen should first be raised. The soul then freed from the power of the devil would free its own flesh from sin. 
The flesh that is healed from infirmity cannot free the soul from its sin, but rather inclines it yet further from what is right, for the well-being of the flesh wars against the discipline of righteousness. But Matthew begins with the account of the leper made clean and the mystery of the flesh. Why is this? Is there a reason which the other evangelists have not disclosed? No, but he has recorded the event more fully. Where they tell of the deliverance of the possessed man, in the mystery of the soul, he likewise, because of the salvation of the soul, tells of Christ teaching on the mountain, of which the others have not written. For as the banishment of the unclean spirit freed the soul from the power of sin, which was first committed at the prompting of the devil, so also the word of doctrine breaks down the work of the devil and sets the soul free from the dominion of error, frees it from slavery to sin, and from the other evils which are born from the suggestion of the evil one. Because not alone is he afflicted by the devil, whose body is tormented by him, but all who do his will are so afflicted. He places the sign of the healed leper within the mystery of man made clean. For leprosy is a carnal affliction. But however, lest people might say, sublime and wonderful are his words, but deeds there are none. To speak sublimely is no great thing, but to work wonders matters much. Accordingly, he brought forward the leper, that by the miracle of his healing, he might give authority to the words. He had been speaking, so that being held wonderful in word, he might be yet more wonderful in deed. And behold the leper, as though prepared beforehand, meets him as he comes down from the mountain. It may be that for this cause he came down, that he might heal the leper. For sin is the leprosy of the soul. So the Lord descends from the heights of heaven as from a high mountain apart to cure the leprosy of our sins. Why think you did this man not go up with the others into the mountain to hear the divine discourse? Because he was burdened with leprosy and bearing the weight of his sins and unable to ascend there. Or heard you not the prophet saying that they must be unstained that ascend the ecclesiastical mountain? Who, he says, shall ascend into the mountain of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? The innocent of hands and the clean of heart. And so whosoever walks with evil cannot ascend into the church, which is here named the mountain of the Lord nor hearken to her spiritual instruction. And should he come there, he comes indeed in his body, in his soul he goes not up. For he who comes not with a pure heart gains nothing, for he comes only in his body. And should he hear spiritual things, he will not understand, because his intelligence is corrupted by the leprosy of carnal sin. For no one can discern the flavor of good things while reveling in what is evil. For as long as evil delights him, good cannot give him pleasure. Then only will he begin to delight in what is good when evil begins to displease him. Came and adored him. Faith and its confession form a perfect prayer, as the apostle says, for with the heart we believe unto justice but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For as the leper, adoring, fulfilled the duty of faith, he fulfilled that of confessing with words, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. He besought him, not as a man that was skilled, but adored him as God. And to his spiritual physician he offered a spiritual payment, for all physicians are paid in money, he pays with prayer alone. And in truth, nothing is more fittingly offered to God than trustful prayer. For whatsoever material thing we offer is not ours, but our prayer is our own. Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. 
He doubted not that the will of God is disposed to every good action, saying, If thou wilt. This does not imply doubt on the part of the leper, but rather the expression of his mind regarding Christ's judgment. For since Christ is good, he wills not to bestow that which is harmful, even though he be asked. Neither is bodily integrity profitable to everyone. Since therefore he knew not whether his healing was expedient for him or otherwise, he was unsure as to the divine will, although knowing it disposed to every good. For to believe good of the divine mercy is the sign of a believing man. To know the judgments of the divine mercy is beyond the power either of man or of faith, since it is plain that not even the apostle did not know this when he thrice besought the Lord that the sting of the flesh, the angel of Satan, might depart from him, which had been given to him, lest he be exalted, and for which cause it was said to him, My grace is sufficient for thee, for power is made perfect in infirmity. It is as if the leper said, I believe that whatsoever is good, thou wilt it but I know not if what I seek is for me a good. But this I clearly doubt not, but rather believe, that if this be good for me, thou dost will it also. The words of the leper therefore show him to be uncertain, not of the mercy of God, but of the judgments of the divine mercy. And Jesus, stretching forth his hand, touched him. Because it was laid down in the law, that he who touched a leper would be unclean until sundown. He touched the leper, not as a servant of the law, but as its Lord. For the law is under the lawgiver. It is not the lawgiver that is subject to the law. What then? Did he do away with the law? No, the letter of the law he did indeed break, but its purpose he did not set aside, but rather gave added dignity to that purpose. For if the law could have ordained that leprosy would not taint a person touching a leper, it would not have forbidden that anyone should touch the leper. It therefore laid it down that no one was to touch a leper, because it could not secure that the leprosy would not taint the one so touching. He therefore, who in touching the leper was not soiled by the leprosy, did not act contrary to the law but even goes beyond that which the law required. Because not alone was he unstained by the leprosy, but he himself made the leper clean. Neither is it believable that he could be said to be stained by the leprosy, who had healed the leprosy. For the law forbade the touching of a leper, not so that lepers might not be healed, but lest those touching leprosy be contaminated. He therefore, who in touching was not stained, but rather made clean the leper, did more than the law required. He touched the leper, and so broke the letter of the law, in order that not alone the leprosy of the body, but also that that of the soul might be taken away. We must compassionate the infirmity of the body, not despise it. The infirmity, however, of the soul must not be compassionated, but despised. For the infirmity of our body depends not upon ourselves as to whether it comes or does not come upon us, but the infirmity of our soul is within our own power. And whether it comes upon us or not depends only upon ourselves. The infirmity of our bodies holds us fast. We do not hold fast to it. The infirmity within our souls holds us not, we rather cling to it. Therefore, the one infirmity is to be compassionated, the other despised. He therefore rescinded the law, but not the righteousness of the law. Not that law which has created men he inscribed upon their hearts, but that rather which he wrote upon a book, whilst the people were adoring a calf, not that law of which it was said, The law of the Lord is unspotted, converting souls, but that of which it was said, 
for the law worketh wrath, for where there is no law, neither is there transgression. How could that law be worthy of being observed which brought about sins? Fittingly, therefore, being pleased, he put away that which in his wrath he had ordained. For if the law were not taken away, the leprosy of the soul would never be healed, because each one who lives under the law is a leper. I will be thou made clean, and forthwith his leprosy was cleansed. Not from this that he touched the leper did the leprosy depart, but because he commanded it to go, so that it might be seen that he touched the leper, not so as to drive away the leprosy, but so as to undo the law. For as to the leprosy, a word would have sufficed. Not even a word was necessary, but only his will to heal. He used his will, therefore, for the leprosy, his voice because of those who were witnesses, for he, had he cured him in silence with so many standing about the person of Christ, who then could know by what power he had been healed? Accordingly he said, I will be thou made clean, so that all present might know that it was by his power the man was healed who had laid down the laws of health. That he said, I will, indicated his will in response to what the leper had said, if thou wilt. That he said, be thou made clean, is a command preceding from his power in response to what was begged by the other. Thou canst make me clean. And Jesus saith to him, See thou tell no man, but go, shew thyself to the priest, and offer the gift which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Do not understand this as meaning that Moses had ordered this gift in testimony to the priests, but as meaning, go you and offer a gift for a testimony unto them. He did not say either, go, show yourself to the priests and tell no one, but first tell no one, and then go show thyself. For he did not bid keep silent for always, but only until he had shown himself to the priests, lest perhaps in telling it to someone else, the news passing from mouth to mouth, the priest would come to hear of it, and because of their hate and enmity towards Christ, they might seize the man on the pretext of his leprosy and drive him forth and not accept him as made clean. Accordingly, he bids him offer them gifts, so that if they should afterwards try and drive him forth, he could then say to them, You have taken the gifts from me as from one made clean, and how then do you now drive me forth as a leper? If I am still a leper, you should not have taken my gifts as though I were made clean, for if I were made clean, you cannot then drive me forth. Or considering the same thing in another way, all the works of healing wrought by Christ contain within them mysteries of the hidden purposes of God. The bodily benefits of his healing were theirs then, now they are ours. The spiritual gains are perhaps ours alone. This leper, therefore, who immediately after the Sermon of Enlightenment comes forward as though prepared, was a figure of the Jewish people standing below as the people stood, hearing the word of God spoken from above and believing it and adoring it and embracing it. For everyone who adores the word of God, believing it to be divine and embracing it with all his heart, the word of God has without doubt touched his soul. For it is not possible that a soul which embraces the word is not touched by it. When, however, the word has touched it, it cleans it of the leprosy of unbelief, as is written, Now you are clean by reason of the word, which I have spoken to you. And Peter also says, Purifying their hearts by faith. For which reason the people who had grown up under the harsh rule of the law, and had not yet come to know the dispensation of mercy, 
believe firmly according to the tradition of their fathers and the divine power. But being uncertain regarding his mercy, they say, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. For the law spoke full of the might of God, but of his mercy in a veiled manner. And so the Lord makes up to them, who knew the power of the Christ according to the law, what was wanting in their knowledge, so that they might also come to learn of the mercy of his grace, and said, I will be thou made clean. And he saith to them, Go offer the gift which Moses commanded. What gifts? Two turtles or two young pigeons? For all righteousness is contained within those two, in abstinence from evil doing and in the doing of good works. By a turtle, therefore, he orders that the people cleansed from unbelief offer holiness to God by abstaining from evil, since the spiritual chastity of the soul consists in absence of evil, so that it commingles not with an alien spirit, nor receives the seed of its inspiration, lest it bring forth work similar to the evil spirit. But the dove has signified every good work that arises out of charity, since it is charity that begets every good work. Whosoever, therefore, loves his neighbor as himself, takes from his neighbor nothing of good, nor from himself. When, therefore, anyone has fulfilled this twofold righteousness, he will keep himself from evil, which is the work of chastity, and doing whatsoever good he may, which is the work of charity, he manifestly becomes such a person as shall be rightly cleansed from the leprosy of unbelief. So does a people rightly cleansed, and offering to God such sacrifices become a witness against the unbelieving priests, who glorying in the letter of the law have rejected the author of the law, who washes away the sins of the people whom the law was unable to make clean. And if, and if you have embraced the word of God with all your heart, the word will touch your soul also, since he loves them that love him, as is said in the Proverbs of Solomon, and will cleanse thee of every leprosy of unbelief. When, however, he will have made thee clean, he will command thee that thou wilt show thyself to the priests as one made clean restraining thyself from every contamination of evil doing, and unfolding in good works your charity to all men, so that through these sacrifices you may learn from the priests that you are made clean, since they see thee not doing to another that which you are yourself unwilling to endure, but rather doing to all men that which you would wish them to do unto you. But if thou wilt not offer these sacrifices to God, it is plain to the sight of all men that you are not yet made clean, but that you still abide a leper in your former faithful faithlessness. Amen. St. Cyril, Bishop and Doctor, The Mystical Significance of the Healing of the Leper. Behold, a leper came. The faith of this man who came to Jesus is indeed worthy of all our praise. He testified that Emmanuel can do all things perfectly, and he pleads with him that by his divine command he might be delivered of his leprosy, although it was an incurable disease. For leprosy is not wont to yield to the remedies of the physicians. For he says, have I not seen unclean spirits driven forth by divine power and other men freed from other diseases? I know that this has been done by some divine and invincible hand. I see also that thou art both good and most kind, and that you show compassion to all that come to thee. Why then should I not also seek thy mercy? What did Christ say to this? He confirmed him in his faith, and by this miracle showed that he approved it. He receives his prayer and reveals that he can do this, saying to him, I will, be thou made clean. 
He also bestows on him the touch of his holy and omnipotent hand, and immediately the leprosy leaves him and his sickness departs. Let you join with me in awe, beholding Christ at work as both God and man. For it belongs to his divinity so to will that all things are as he wills. It is a human act to stretch forth the hand. In both the one and the other Christ is perceived since the word became flesh. And Jesus saith to him, See thou tell no man. The character of the wonder that was performed, even though the leper remained silent, was enough to reveal to all who had known the leper the power of the one who had healed him. Nevertheless, he bids him tell no man. Why? That they who have received from God the gift of healing may learn that they are not to look for applause from those they heal, nor accept praise from others, lest they fall into pride which is the wickedest of all sins. But go, show thyself to the priest, and offer. Prudently, therefore, he counsels the leper to offer a gift to the priests according to the law of Moses. For though without any doubt he intended to take away the shadows and to change the figures of the law into the pure spiritual worship, yet because the Jews did not believe in him, but still clung to the precepts of Moses, as though the old law still endured, he permits the leper to do this for a testimony unto them. Why did he do this? The Jews at all times were proclaiming their zeal for the law and declaring that the great prophet Moses was the minister of the will of heaven, and they strove to belittle Christ, the Savior of all men. And so they said openly, We know that God spoke to Moses but as to this man we know not whence he is. It was therefore necessary to convince them by these signs that the dignity of Moses was below the glory of Christ. Moses was but a faithful servant in the house of God. Christ was the son in the house of his father. And so from the healing of the leper, it was clearly evident that Christ, in an incomparable manner, far transcended the law of Moses. For Mary, the sister of Moses, because she had murmured against him, was stricken with leprosy. And Moses, at this affliction of his sister, was profoundly aggrieved. But since he was unable to banish the disease from the woman, falling down before God, he besought him, saying, O God, I beseech thee, heal her. Now observe carefully. In the one case, there is entreaty. With prayer he sought to obtain the divine clemency. But the Savior of mankind, with authority that was truly divine, says, I will be thou made clean. This healing of the leper served therefore as a warning to the priests that from it they should learn that those who gave precedence to Moses were wandering from the truth. Without doubt, they should reverence Moses as the minister of the law a helper of the grace made known by angels, but much more is Emmanuel to be praised and glorified as the true Son of God and the Father. It may be that someone would like to see here the great and profound mystery concerning Christ, which is related to us in Leviticus. The law of Moses declared that a leper shall be condemned of uncleanness and ordered to be driven forth from the camp as unclean. Afterward, should the sickness leave him, it prescribed that he be received back into the camp. It lays down in what manner he shall be regarded as made clean, saying, This is the right of a leper. When he is to be cleansed, he shall be brought to the priest, who going out of the camp, when he shall find that the leprosy is cleansed, shall command him, that is, to be purified, to offer for himself two living sparrows, which it is lawful to eat, and he shall command one of the sparrows to be immolated in an earthen vessel over living waters. But the other that is alive, he shall dip in the blood of the sparrow that is immolated, wherewith he shall sprinkle him that is to be cleansed seven times, that he be rightly purified. And he shall let go the living sparrow in the field. 
There were accordingly two sound, that is, clean birds, free according to the law of every defect, of which one is slain over living waters, the other, exempt from slaughter, being sprinkled with the blood of the one that was slain, and then set free. This figure truly designates the great and ever-to-be-adored mystery of our Savior. For he, the word, was from above, that is, from the Father and from heaven, and so is appropriately compared with the bird. By his incarnation he came down in the likeness of our nature and took upon himself the form of a slave. But even in this he was from above, for which reason, speaking with the Jews, he said openly to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. And again, and no man hath ascended into heaven, but he that descended from heaven, the Son of Man. For as I have just now said, being made flesh, that is, truly man, he yet was not of the earth, nor of clay like us, but heavenly and supramundane, as God is understood to be. Nevertheless, it is truly lawful to see Christ in the figure of the birds, having suffered in the flesh, as the scripture says, yet remaining beyond the reach of suffering, humanly dead, divinely living, for the word is life. Wherefore it is that the most wise disciple says of him, that being put to death indeed in the flesh, but enlivened in the spirit, that though the Word could not suffer in his own divine nature, nevertheless he truly made his own the passion of his body. For the living bird was sprinkled with the blood of the one that was slain, and so died with its blood, and becoming almost a sharer of its suffering, was sent forth into the desert. For the only begotten Word of the Father has returned to heaven, and with him the flesh of our lowliness, and there was a strange spectacle in heaven. For the family of heaven were astonished at seeing the king of the earth, the Lord of all powers, appearing as one of us. And they exclaimed, Who is this that cometh from Edom, that is, from the earth, with dyed garments from Basra, which is interpreted as meaning flesh, or straightness, or affliction? Then shall they say to him, What are these wounds in the midst of thy hands? And he shall say, with these I was wounded in the house of them that loved me. For as after his resurrection, Christ, showing his hands, most prudently bade the doubting Thomas touch in them the marks of the nails, and likewise the opening in his side, so also returning to heaven, he makes known to the holy angels that Israel had deservedly fallen from his favor and friendship. And for this, he shows them his garments dyed with blood and the wounds in his hands, not because he could not obliterate them, for risen from the dead he had put off corruptibility and with it whatsoever arose from it, but that according to the divine plan of the incarnation, the manifold wisdom of God may be made known to the principalities and powers in heavenly places through the church which he made in Christ Jesus our Lord. But someone may say, Why do you speak of one and the same Christ, since there were two birds offered? Does not the law here obscurely imply by this that there were two sons and two Christs? They would indeed fall into grievous irreverence, who would believe and profess that one is the Christ above, the word of God the Father, and another, he that was born of the house of David. We, however, here declare to those who, because of ignorance, believe that this is so, we say, I repeat, what the divine Paul wrote, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. If therefore you should say that there are two sons, there will then be two faiths and as many baptisms. He will therefore proclaim what is false, who has Christ so speaking in him, as the same Paul says, these things are not true, far from it. Therefore we know but one Lord, the only begotten, incarnate word of the Father, making no separation between man and God, but declaring that the word of God the Father became man, 
continuing in his Godhead at the same time. Moreover, for argument's sake, let the adversaries of the truth say, if there are two sons, one born of the stock of David, the other the word of God the Father, will not the latter then be higher in nature than the son that is born of the family of David? But note what follows. When we were speaking of the two birds, they were in no way different in nature from each other, but rather similar, and without any difference, each exactly as the other. Therefore they must concede that because of the uniform nature of the birds, the word of God should differ in no way from the man. But here they make no headway, for humanity profoundly differs from the divinity. The figures then must be understood in a manner that confirms with reason Furthermore, we say that even the law was but a shadow, a figure, and as it were a picture which showed the future to those who were looking towards it. The law, therefore, was a picture, a type, of the things which brought forth truth, so that even though there were two birds, yet by them but one Christ was prefigured, both as suffering and as not suffering, dying, yet above all dying, finally also ascending to heaven as a second beginning of humanity reborn to immortality. He in truth has prepared for us a new way to heaven and we in due time shall follow him. That one of the birds was slain and that the other was sprinkled with the blood of the one that was slain and that being freed it escaped slaughter must all be considered as a figure of the things that now are true. For Christ died for us, and we are baptized in his death, and he by his blood redeemed us, who with the Father and the Holy Ghost liveth and reigneth, world without end. Amen.